up now. All right. And again, don't forget to put in your name, school, and grade level. Okay. Okay. So let me go ahead and get going here. Let's see. All right. Since we're talking about social justice and um, inclusivity, right? I always like to use this kind of little warm up in my classes, whether I'm teaching or I'm subbing or I'm giving a workshop. So very quickly, as we get people kind of slowly getting started, go ahead and circle, right? Put a dot or even put it in the chat if you want. If you can go anywhere right now, well, I'll just give you one spot, right? If you can fly anywhere, where would you want to travel to? What's a place that you'd like to learn more about, like to visit or maybe revisit? Take a moment and see if you can do that. I like to do this with students. Uh, I was just in a class where I was showing them how to do blogging, so how to create a website. And you can use the pen there, right, to circle or to highlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a good way to kind of break the ice with some students, have some conversations. I was in a middle school and everybody wanted to go to Canada. Oh, <laughs> all of a sudden it was like a, Large majority of the students wanted to go to Canada. Many wanted to go also to Japan. So that was always nice, right? Uh, you can make the screen bigger if you're if you need to see a little bit bigger. Right. All right. So we have a few responses there. All right. I see some people headed over to Argentina and I don't know if that's Seattle over there. <laughs> All right. Thank you. If you're just coming in, here's the code again for our uh, Pear Deck, right? So you can go to joinpd.com. Okay. You could go there. All right. And you can see the responses here. All right. <laughs> and I could always see, you know, different students. Of course, that's why I like Pear Deck. So we can have instant feedback and see where people are at, have conversations about that. Again, I'm just showing just different techniques that I might use to get students engaged in this conversation about different cultures and so forth. All right, please let me know if there's any delay um, and uh, with my audio, I know it sometimes happens. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move on. Thank you so much. We'll maybe come back to that. All right, well, what is our goal today? Here's, I know it's a bit ambitious, but some of the goals that we have today is we're gonna just do a quick little brief welcome. We have a guest speaker here today. We're gonna talk about AB 101, not AB 1, AB 101, and why uh, in, uh, why we have uh, our interdisciplinary ethnic studies uh, program, right? Uh, why, why that is important. We're gonna talk about some updates of where uh, HLP is at, right? And sorry, that's intersectional <laughs> ethnic studies program. Where we are at on that journey uh, with ethnic studies, there is a graduation requirement. And how do we compare? How are we doing compared to other districts? What are they doing? We have some great examples. I'm going to show you lots of different teaching resources. And then we're going to take a look at some sample lessons, both for the upper grades and the uh, lower grades. And then hopefully you'll have a chance to kind of brainstorm a little bit or percolate on some ideas of what you're having. Like I said, you'll have lots of different resources you can look at. So welcome those of you who are trickling in. Welcome, welcome. And once again, I'm going to keep repeating this. If you're joining us, here's a join PD. Here's our Paradeck code. It's always here in the upper corner. You can join us there if you wish to participate in the Paradeck. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of read this off for anybody who might be uh, driving or just kind of listening in, uh, because I think it was kind of an important quote. So when we talk about social justice, what do we mean? There are different ways to go about it. So I'm going to read this part where it says, teachers can promote social justice by incorporating diverse perspectives and voices into their lessons. This includes using inclusive literature, inviting guest speakers from marginalized communities, and discussing current events that highlight social injustices. And as you can see here, there's a hyperlink where you can actually see the entire article, which also has other resources for you to look at. So again, that's what you're going to see today. Uh, it's just different ways and models of how to create a more uh, a unit, a classroom that promotes social justice. All right, well, I am so happy to welcome Ron Espiritu. He is our Intersectional Ethics Studies Coordinator. He comes with lots of experience. He's been doing a lot here in our district. <laughs> Had his head spinning for a good while, uh, <laughs> literally, I think, right? Uh, because uh, he's been running our Ethics Studies uh, program as we're trying to create courses. And also for those of you in ELA, we're trying to create some ELA 
ethics studies courses too. So I'm gonna let him introduce himself uh, and we'll move on from there. Thank you. Go ahead, Rob. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Adeseli, is it okay if I take over the sharing? Share screen? Yeah, yes. So I'm gonna go there and you can go ahead and share. Thank you. Okay, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, Araceli, for inviting me uh, and for being such a wonderful partner in this work. Um, I'm excited to meet meet some of you folks here virtually. Um, I hope I've met some of you. I think I recognize your names and I've seen before in person. And if I haven't, then um, I, I look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, but for now, it's nice to connect with you virtually. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Rana Spiritu. I have been a teacher of ethnic studies, a leader of different K-12 interdisciplinary ethnic studies programs over the past 18 years, mostly in Los Angeles, or all in Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles, Southeast LA, and Southgate, Huntington Park. The last nine years, I've been in MacArthur Park, Westlake, downtown LA, and I'm so excited to be in the San Gabriel Valley, in Hacienda, Heights and La Puente and City of Industry working in our school district. This is about my seventh month in the school district now. One of the things I like to share with folks, I'm a second generation educator. My parents were teachers and school principals as I was growing up. My uh, older sister is a teacher union president. My uh, other older sister is an assistant principal. My wife is a teacher as well. So uh, and a lot of like, like a lot of us, right? A lot of my friends, all these and community members. So I'm excited to be here and to share a little bit about what we've been doing with our intersectional ethnic studies program here in the district and just a little bit about you know what's happening across Southern California and across the state. I previously uh, came on as a consultant for two years previous to this academic school year, but this is my first year fully in the district, um, just finished my seventh month. I'm gonna start with our intersectional ethnic studies definition. This is a definition Adesali, do they have access to the slides deck? Because I put a lot of resources in the notes. Yes, they will. They'll have access to all of this. Okay, so when you do have access to the slides deck, you'll be able to click on our website. Um, or Adesali, if you don't mind, do you think you can put a link to the Intersectional Ethnic Studies website in the, in the chat box? So the website has our definition, our mission statement, our vision statement that you can review. This definition took a few years to create, and it was created out of the district office in collaboration with teachers. Students had input. The Intersectional Ethics Studies Learning Partnership had impact, input as well. So I'm going to start here. Intersectional Ethics Studies is a dynamic and collectively constructed curriculum and pedagogy that centers the histories, cultures, and struggles of marginalized communities in the U.S. In addition, it seeks to analyze systems of oppression and the relationships of identity and power impacting Black, African Americans, Chicanx, Latinx, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Arab Americans, Indigenous people, and other ethnic racial groups, as well as lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, and transgender people, and people of different gender identities, as well as people with disabilities, undocumented people, and those experiencing other forms of marginalization. As an intersectional perspective, this approach takes into account the ways our multiple identities intersect with relationships of power in society. Lastly, intersectional ethnic studies is rooted in both individual and collective empowerment, centering the importance of education as a collective exercise that supports our movement towards educational and social justice, which is the topic of today's uh, presentation and conversation. And so I start there. It is a mouthful. There's a lot here. But I think it's important to identify what it is. Um, and another another part of ethnic studies I like to share is that it's good for students. So there's been a number of qualitative and quantitative research studies that shows the positive impact that ethnic studies pedagogy has on students in terms of their ability to uh, improve their reading, writing, speaking, listening skills. That's demonstrated in multiple studies like the San Francisco uh, unified school districts, uh, Stanford and the Stanford Graduate School of Education, um, both Professor D and Professor Penner uh, did a research project on the positive impact it had on students' GPA rates, attendance rates, uh, less behavioral problems. Similar studies were conducted in Tucson, Arizona, which showed increase 
uh, positive correlation in test scores and reading, writing, even math, and also um, other positive aspects like higher graduation rates and less dropout rates. So there's there's a body of research that's um, continued to correlate these quantitative and qualitative studies. I also wanted to share with y'all the intersectional ethnic studies pedagogical framework that we're using. So this presentation isn't going into great detail in each of them, uh, but it's important that we work to, you know, and, and I'm working to help us collectively as a school district to see the different ways that ethnic studies pedagogy can be rolled out. And the way I look at it is like, we all have different on-ramps to the work. A lot of people, most likely a lot of people on this call are already doing some of these practices in their classrooms. They've been doing it with students for a long time. And, and some are familiar with some of the theoretical frameworks, others are new to them, but there's a lot of practices that we've already been doing. And so a lot of folks start at the culture, the responsive, uh, pedagogical framework, which a lot of us have are familiar with. Anti-racism and anti-oppression is connected to that social justice aspect. Community responsive is also connected to social justice and decolonial or critiques of colonization and how it's impacted people past, present, and future. Uh, and so these are the pedagogical frameworks they were using in order to uh, inform the way that we're changing, developing uh, new types of curriculum and approaches. And the way I like to think about this framework is that each one of these uh, you know, pillars that are here are a part of a, a bigger conversation, right? So just for culturally responsive pedagogy, there's culturally relevant education, there's uh, culturally responsive instruction, there's something called culturally sustaining pedagogy. And so there's a lot of scholars and practitioners that are writing about this as we practice it. So what I love to say and what I love is reading, right? So how can we read books like Goldie Muhammad's Cultivated Genius, uh, Transformative Ethnic Studies by uh, Miguel Sleeter, Miguel Zapata and Christine Sleeter as a way to inform our work. Uh, I also have a lot of copies of the Rethinking Ethnic Studies book. So if you are interested in receiving a copy of the, that book, you can put it in the chat box and I can figure out how to get a copy of it to you. In that book that's in the top right hand corner, there's a lot of articles that can inform how we engage in this work. Adeselia was mentioning AB 101. So I wanted to share with you the top four goals of, that we've identified for the Intersectional Ethnic Studies program this year. The first is the development of courses to meet the requirements of AB 101, which I'm about to go over. The second is creating a civic engagement program, building on the previous civic engagement and civic advocacy work that's already existed in the district. We're developing K-12 interdisciplinary pathways simultaneously as we're developing these courses. And we're bringing in the community with us with the Intersectional Ethnic Studies Learning Partnerships, uh, which is a group of uh, parents, community members, teachers, and staff members, and students too. So um, Adeseli mentioned AB 101. This is a law that was passed by the California legislature uh, just a couple of years ago. And this is like 60 years in the making. So I love to show this picture in the type right-hand corner because it's me and my father in front of LUSD in 2014 when that school district created a graduation requirement for ethnic studies ahead of the state uh, AB 101 law that was passed just a, a couple of years ago. The law says that um, for the class of uh, graduating class of 2930, which is the incoming class of 2526, all high school students across the state need to take at least one ethnic studies course. And so we are two years into that process. Courses can be a social studies ethnic studies course. They can also be an ELA, art, Spanish, so they can, students can get both credit for an ELA 10 course, for example, and also meet the graduation requirement of an ethnic studies class before they graduate. So where are we right now? So uh, let's see, two, two years ago, three years ago, um, we started with a pilot program. So the, the 22, geez, I'm sorry, 21, 22, we piloted with five teachers, um, at the intersectional ethnic studies courses in the social studies department. This year, we grew those courses to 11 sections. So we have 11 current sections at all high schools, including Valley. And next year, we're planning to, we're currently working on 
an ELA 10 with ethnic studies scores, a Spanish three honors with ethnic studies scores, and a history of film with ethnic studies scores. So those will be piloted next year as we prepare for the 25-26 rollout. And so AB 101 is that law that we're trying to meet. There is something called the Ethnic Studies Model Curriculum that Adeseli is going to share a little bit later on that gives us some models and ways of how we're going to meet that requirement as we create the courses. We're also trying to make sure that the courses that we're creating here in Hacienda La Puente Unified are localized and place-based and, and that they're based on reading writing writing, speaking, listening skills. They're based on the standards of that course. So when I talk about ELA with ethnic studies, we're teaching all of the ELA common core standards. We're teaching the skill sets. Same thing for social studies and the other academic disciplines. We're using ethnic studies content as a vehicle to engage in that, but using engagement strategies that are consistent with the pedagogical pillars that I shared above uh, to make sure that we're engaging students with that content. This is a graphic that kind of shows our, our two-pronged approach, right? One is the, the creation of the courses, which meet the requirements of AB 101. Also simultaneously, we're developing our civic engagement program, helping students to earn the California State Seal of Civic Engagement through our ethnic studies classes. So that's happening at the high schools. Simultaneously, we're developing uh, ethnic studies pathways, uh, in K-8 K interdisciplinary, and that helps us to diversify the curriculum and uh, new training and new development. I kind of already talked about the multi-year way that we kind of rolled out this program. Um, we took steps first by like engaging, this is for the high school social studies ethnic studies course. We did it learning together. We worked collaboratively to build a course outline. After that, we actually created a course reader uh, that we use at the high school level. And then we started creating lesson plans and unit plans to teach our students. This is a, a picture of the course reader. What is important, right, in thinking about literacy in ELA is our ethnic studies class is really literacy rich. So students are reading and writing, they're, they're using reader's marks to, to mark up the articles inside the reader. We're engaging in different type of project-based approaches uh, and, you know, this is all from, from that reader, which has been really helpful and powerful. These are the six units that we teach in that high school social studies, ethnic studies course. Uh, so we teach the major racial ethnic groups that make up the umbrella of ethnic studies and the, the discipline. We also teach a, a youth participatory action research project that we're currently working on. We've also been trying to bring a lot of community members into classrooms to work and talk with students and to lead workshops and presentations. And we've also been taking students off campus as well to visit places like the Japanese American Museum in downtown LA or the Chich Marin uh, Center for Chicano Art and Culture in Riverside. And we have other field trips planned in some of those classes as well. I think what's unique about our model in HLPUSD is that teachers are collaborating together. So we're actually co-writing lesson plans, unit plans, lesson cycles to teach these courses. And that's exciting because not all school districts have that, that model. And, um, and then the last couple of pieces I share, I'm sharing is that there's groups of teachers that are participating in intensive training. So um, one of the partnerships we have is with the South Castro Academy. This is a uh, entity that's organized by Cal State LA in partnership with HOPUSD and El Rancho Unified School District, which was the first school district in the state of California to have an ethnic studies graduation requirement. We meet with them on a regular basis every month uh, to continue learning more about pedagogical practices, uh, youth participatory action research. And it's been really fruitful. We're actually looking to uh, continue into a second year with that collaboration it's something that maybe some folks in this call might be interested in participating. We're gonna have a K-8 cohort and a second year cohort of high school as well. We also have a partnership with the University of California Irvine History Project who works directly with our ethnic studies teachers to develop that civic engagement project. We regularly attend trainings from the LA County Office of Education and there's other partnerships that we're uh, currently working on. I mentioned South Castro Academy. This has been a great place for us to learn and grow together along with our colleagues from El Rancho Unified. We're looking to continue this. So maybe some of you in this call might be interested. In the future, we're still sorting out the details and figuring out the funding, 
but in the future, you may receive an email about participating in the Sal Castro Academy. I can answer any questions about that in the near future. Um, almost finally, uh, Araceli asked me to, to mention also what's happening in other school districts. So on this slide, there's a link to, I mean, mo on most slides, there's links to resources, but on this slide, there's a link to other course outlines from other school districts, both that shared by the state. And then I shared another uh, link that's local school districts, their ethnic studies course outlines. So um, I'm happy to be in the San Gabriel Valley because many of my ethnic studies colleagues at Rancho Unified, at Montebello Unified, at Norwalk La Mirada, we're trying to create a um, ethnic studies, a San Gabriel Valley Ethnic Studies Collective to um, continue our interdistrict collaborative practices. So that's something I'm excited about. And finally, we, we have something called the Intersectional Ethnic Studies Learning Partnership. So these are community members, parents, staff that have been informing our work as we navigate how to build out this program, K-12, TK through 12, inside of our district. And that's been a really fruitful space. A lot of the, um, the documents and the frameworks and the mission statement and the vision statement that you can find on our website that Adiseli shared in the chat box came from that learning partnership. So I know I just shared a mouthful. <laughs> I appreciate y'all listening. I'm gonna pass it to Adiseli, who's gonna um, take the next part. I don't know, am I supposed to tee up the next part? I'm gonna let, <laughs> hey, I'm gonna let you, you do it, Adiseli. Okay. <laughs> I gotcha, all right. I'm gonna go ahead and if you can stop sharing, I'll share my, all right, everyone. So uh, it, it's funny cause he's like, I could get it down to 10 minutes, 15 minutes tops. He's been practicing this uh, this elevator speech, which is definitely what sometimes, sometimes we need is like, just give us the down and dirty, what is going on, right? What's happening with this? So uh, thank you, Ron, for that. Like I said, he's been working so hard and we're so happy to have him here. I think definitely an important piece uh, for our district and our students. I'm going to go ahead and switch it over to, if you haven't done so, you're welcome to jump onto Pear Deck, and this just gives you the links. You can also interact a little bit more. So those of you who came in, you can go to Join PD. You can do it on your phone if you want to, or you can just follow along. You could add it on the chat. Uh, let's go ahead and just kind of take a moment. That was a lot of information. What's a couple of takeaways? You could do one, two, three, right? What are some things that just kind of stuck in your mind? Maybe that, oh, maybe you didn't know, or maybe you have questions about, or you just thought like, oh, wow, that's that's great information, right? So let's take a moment and give me, uh, just either put it in the chat or put it on Pear Deck. What, the, what are a couple of takeaways from this portion, this information that we just got? So we'll do that, right? Go ahead and, and do that for a moment. Have you done any work yourself with ethnic studies or social justice? Sometimes we do things and we don't even realize like, hey, you know what, actually, yes, everything I do does uh, is paying attention to the diverse needs of our students. Or yes, I have invited and I know because I have some teachers here that I work with who have done some amazing projects with students uh, and brought in whether it's cultural awareness a celebration of people's of students' backgrounds and so forth. So we'll see where we're at with that. Let's see if we're getting here. All right, I'm just gonna read some of these off. So with teaching the civil rights movement and connecting the information to LA Tech, such as Langston's Hughes be counted. Uh, Ron can give us a little like, right? Yes, definitely. Like we said, you know, we've been, we have been Absolutely, doing yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, information about the works, uh, surround, yeah, in different districts, right? It's really amazing. I, I'm part of the, uh, right, the Cell Castro Academy. It's been great working with teachers who've been doing this for a good while. And in fact, they were at some of the conferences I've been to. Uh, so they're spreading, you know, the news and then sharing the wealth. So it's great. I uh, would like to see the inclusive materials books that people are using, yes, as we're building these curriculums, especially those in the, uh, the lower grades, you know, and, and now that you know that there's a graduation requirement that are all of our students, We'll have to have this. It's great if we can, you know, we already have some of this like vertical alignment. How else can we keep preparing our students for these kind of discussions, right? So that we're not waiting until they're they're in high school. So I'm going to have you kind of keep thinking about that. I'm going to check here, right? Again, you could put it on the chat. 
And I'm going to go ahead and actually see here, looking at the time, right? So we're going to come back to this, right? There'll be other moments to reflect, to think about this. I mean, we're going to go ahead and jump into our this next part. All right. So with this next part here, let's talk about what resources we have. So I know we have different grade levels. Um, I'm mainly the ELA, uh, you know, TOSA for secondary school. So sixth through 12th grade, we use study sync. But again, I want you to think about your own curriculum. And we're going to just take a little dive into uh, the things that you can be doing with study sync. So if I were to log in, here's my login. One of the things, of course, that I'm sure you have all looked at, of course, we have our curriculum, right? So if I was teaching sixth grade, here are the different things. Um, one of the things that I kind of found interesting is, you know, when we look at units, such as, let's say, our heroes, how can we make sure we're hearing the different voices of our students, right? I'm going to go ahead and think it locked me out. Uh, so, you know, I know that in that unit, I love Greek mythology, and I love studying, you know, some of these, you know, literature and the classics. However, do they include all of our students, you know, the, the students who are sitting in our classroom, can they see themselves there? So again, you know, I'm not going to go into the curriculum here, but I want you to think about how can we maybe add maybe some new pieces. So well, I'm going to head over to the library. And some of you might know this, but those of you who don't, right, know that you can have a little bit more real world, maybe more up to date materials that you can use. If I go here to the filter, take a look here at the different tags that we have. So let's say I want to do a unit on immigration, right? Or I want to do it on women authors, right? Maybe some Chicano authors. Notice how there are 13 graphic novels. When we talk about social justice, let's think about different ways students learn, right? Sometimes for some of our students, those big blocks of text is difficult for our kiddos, right? What about a graphic novel? Uh, maybe they do better with an uh, autobiography or biographies. So I can even put in here. So one of the things I noticed here is, oh my God, what about our Asian students, right? Or Chinese students? I went ahead and did a little quick research. What happens if I were to look for maybe some Chinese authors? There we go, right? So I can have uh, lots of different choices here, right? And it gives me a whole lesson plan, of course, right? So I have my intro, some caps and reading. So we know that we can take this. Now, one of the things that I like to do is I like to actually cut and paste this reading, throw it on my Google Slides and turn on Pear Deck, right? Um, and make it interactive so that students can comment and draw and so forth, just right? Uh, some people, you know, use just the study sync site. So this is again, a way that I can kind of broaden up a little bit of my curriculum. Remember that um, as a district, we don't say, hey, you must teach this novel. Now at your own school, you might have that, but maybe it's time to have a conversation about how can we maybe freshen up some of those titles or the list? Maybe we're doing some independent readings, things like that. All right, let me pause there, see if there's any questions. All right. Yes, okay, I'm just looking at some of the chat responses there, right? So please chime in if you have any questions. I'm gonna move back here. All right, so then we have here, like I said, you can do uh, look at the library for some resources. Let me show you another place. So I'm going to take just a little bit of time here. Um, can you go ahead, those of you who are there, either give me a virtual or a real thumbs up. Have you ever heard of this website called Teaching Books? The Teaching Books website. Have, has anyone ever heard of it? You can give me a little thumbs up. I'm like, I have no idea what this is, right? You can put it on the chat. Um, this Teaching Books website is something I had just heard about at a conference. And I thought, oh my goodness, how are people... <laughs> Right. Are people aware of this? Have we heard? Uh, I'm seeing Raul saying that, yes, he has. Anybody else? Right. Just want to know how many people might know of this. Right. So you because we're here at Hacienda La Puente, we actually already have um, a license for this. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and take us through this very quickly. I, I, I could definitely do a little one-on-one -on -one PD, or, you know, uh, if you want to invite me to your school, could talk to other teachers about this, but this is a great program for our teachers and for our students. It's actually also available for our students. So let me go ahead and just give you a walkthrough. So here is this teaching books. Once again, when you log in, it'll say, thank you, you know, you're not part of HLPUSD. You can go ahead and search for titles. Now, this is not a library in the sense that it's not a place to check out books. This is a place to preview, to get excited, get students excited about something that they might want to read. 
So I'm going to head on over for, uh, to the place called for educators. So take a look at what you can look at on this website. So you can actually promote books, right? And it has some book trailers and so forth. But the part I'm going to look at is here. Diverse books. All right. Well, what books are out there that maybe, let's say I'm doing a unit, right? So I'm going to go right here where it says, okay, I want to look by culture. All right. So if I go here, take a look. I'm just going to show you here the different options that I have. So, you know, my daughter is a high school student. She's a senior. She's very critical, of course, of school. And she's always like, mom, you know, I wish they would teach us more about African culture, but like, you know, like global African culture, right? Uh, and so uh, she loved, uh, you know, the different, different works that she says, I, I know we talk a lot about, you know, Martin Luther King and so forth. She's like, but I want to know about what's happening right now or what happened in the past or some of the ancestors. So take a look at some of these titles here or some of these topics. Uh, American Indian, right? Asian, Asian American, uh, differently challenged uh, individuals, right? So all kinds of choices that I have here, gender studies, transgender, non-conforming literature, immigrant, refugee, Right, all these again, multiracial, mixed race, all types, right? Um, and so uh, our uh, Latino, right, our LGBTQ, so lots of different works that maybe we have heard of, maybe we haven't, right? So let's say I go here and I want to look at something like Asian American. All right, and so it's going to give me a list of books. Take a look at this, right? So those of you who might be avid readers, you might be like, wow, this is great, right? So it just gives you tons and tons of titles, especially, you know, uh, the youth literature has really taken off, right? Uh, and so we can talk to students about it. We can recommend books for students. Now, notice here on the side, I can filter this. So I can filter it by grade level, right? Maybe I'm teaching a certain um, curricular area, right? Maybe I'm looking at um, certain type of phonemic, maybe I really want my students, I've been working with some elementary students who are struggling a little bit. So maybe I want them to practice, you know, vowel sounds, right, or blends. So this is really kind of, you know, well uh, made little resource here for teachers. Um, let's take a look at grade level. Let's say I want to hit, like I said, I do the upper grades. Take a look at what it has here for the upper grades, right? And notice how many resources it's telling me it has. So here I can see, you know, just different types of books available. Now, again, this is not giving me the book. It might give me a little excerpt, things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this one and let's see what it gives me. So it's going to tell me that there has 53 resources, right? It's going to give me a little resume of the book. It has some audio skills. Now, one of the things I mentioned to, to a lot of schools is that one of the areas our students do really poorly on is the listening, and, uh, listening portion of a CAS and our listening portion for our LPAC students, right? So this listening to an audio recording, a short little audio recording would be great than asking them some questions about what they heard. Take a look, there's also lessons and activities. Some of them are kind of generic, but if you go here, I really like this one, right? And what I liked about it is that it gives me so many possible teaching ideas, right? So it tells me about the book, right? But let's say I don't have access, uh, by the way, which actually, if you wanted this specific book, I believe, Ron, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is one of the books that was on, uh, I think, the book approval list, I think. I thought I saw it on there as one of the books that we are asking for our school district. Which one is it again, I'll tell you? Uh, um, this one is American Born Chinese. I think so. I, yeah, I think yeah. it was on the list. I think I saw it. It is a graphic novel, right? Definitely for younger kids. But... If, you know, once it gets approved, which I'm pretty sure it can, it will be approved, schools, the teacher can say, hey, school, I like to purchase this. I like to, for us to have a class set, or maybe it could be uh, just a few copies for that uh, independent reading that you might have, right? Personal little libraries in your class. So just know that there are resources and we are as a district trying to diversify and add more relevant novels. So I'm gonna go all the way over here because one of the things I liked is that it also has like a rubric for presentations. And I love this one here is project ideas. Uh, I love to take stuff from one place, apply it to somewhere else. So here are just different projects that you can do with this novel, but you can really do with any novel, making a mini comic project, 
doing stereotypes and archetype project, doing a mask project, movie casting. So again, you know, this is a great resource for teachers uh, looking to, to add maybe new titles. Um, the other thing that you can do here, I'm going to show you this part here, is that you can actually create a, a book list for your class and you can share this. I'm going to go right here. It says share this page and I can print out for my students a QR code and that way the students can preview a book. Again, this might be something that they can check out on Sora. You know that we have a digital library so you can have them do this QR, put it around your room, create a little vir uh, virtual library for students to check out new titles. Students also have access to this website. So you could make this available for your students and they can do the same thing and actually go through some of these things here. You can put different titles and almost every title I looked up was here. So if I wanted to look up, you know, we're trying to bring in Zoot Suit, I can bring in Zoot Suit, type it in, and I would give me resources for that. So let's take a moment and in the chat, is this something that you might be interested in? Is this something that you might uh, want to look at on your own time, right? Uh, are there any books that you're thinking, oh, I would love to be able to teach, you know, a certain topic, a certain culture, right? A certain author. So take a moment there if you wish and add in your chat, in the chat, any title, that you might be interested in our topic. I'm gonna to keep going as we do that. And I'm gonna see if I have this open here. All right, all right, and I'm gonna keep going. Okay, so one of the things uh, that we also have is that like uh, like we said, you know, ethnic studies uh, and diverse teaching um, is not new. We've been doing this for a little while. In fact, we have some great TOSAs who've been working with the uh, elementary schools and they created also some so resources for all of you. And that would be under our CIA page. So if you are not on Canvas, you can have go to Canvas, sorry, and add uh, you know, the CIA page and it'll take you to this page right here where you can have access to all the different TOSAs and their websites. So here we have, for example, our history and social studies um, TOSA, our Harpreet Deer, our Dr. Deer has this website where she has resources, especially for those uh, elementary teachers. Also, we have our NPDL, of course, that's our district initiative. And you'll see a lot of NPDL elements as we talk about ethnic studies lesson plans. And of course, here's the one I have, the ELA, both Sil Joe, who does elementary, and I have websites here. And what I have here, especially those of you who teach those older kids, uh, I added some teaching resources, including this one that's called Conscious Hip Hop. So if you want to bring in music or a music lesson, music is a great gateway into discussions on real issues, uh, real world issues, relevant issues. So here is this is comes from the ERWC unit. And I went ahead and added that on our Canvas page. And in fact, let me take you there. So if you go here to right, our Canvas page, you can find lots of that. Uh, let me take a look. So again, uh, and you would go into our the ELA section. For secondary, and in secondary, I went ahead and opened, created an ethnic studies link since we are integrating ethnic studies into some of our ELA courses, and it'll take you to, let me just show you very quickly, some of these lessons. Ron is going to be talking a little bit about the California model curriculum for ethnic studies, where a lot of these come from. Basically, what I did is I took that curriculum that's about 100 pages and kind of created a little short PDFs on some of the these units. And so the, take a look at some of these units that are available. Things like such as Salvadorian immigration or Black Lives Matter, right? The East LA blowouts. Um, again, uh, all types of different uh, units and lessons. These are full lessons with handouts and so forth. All right, I think that's where I'm at with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it on to Ron, who's gonna talk a little bit about the ethnic studies model curriculum. Ron, you want to go ahead? Mm -hmm. yeah. You want? Sally, did you want me to share from from your screen? Uh, I'll let you yeah. share. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me get up the right thing. And then I did put in the chat box if anybody is interested in uh, receiving one of those rethinking schools books. 
I'm pretty sure that I can put it in the mail over here and get it to you. Araceli, is that right? I'm still. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be an easy process. So I'll put it in an envelope, put your name on it and get it shipped out to your school site. So there is a link that I put in the chat box. Just put your name in your school site and I will get that book delivered to you. I have a lot of extras here in my office that I'm trying to get in the hands of teachers. Um, give me just a moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, here I am. Here it is. Okay. <laughs> I had to locate the the slides of deck from <laughs> the Okay. So the Ethnic Studies model curriculum was a collaborative effort of uh, many different educators across the state of California to create. And it's a long document. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages that has links to resources, lesson ideas, course outlines, lesson plans. Uh, it has theoretical frameworks, guiding values and principles, the eight outcomes of ethnic studies. It's a pretty robust document. Uh, humbly, even though I wasn't asked for permission, I have uh, three different course outlines that I wrote. It's in the model uh, course, uh, the ethnic studies model curriculum. So it's a really robust document. It has a bunch of resources there. It, it took years to create. Um, and it's a great place to visit to kind of get inspired and see a lot of different ideas. It is a really big document, though. So, you know, there's a lot of starting places. I think a starting place could be this slides deck, right? This slides presentation that Araceli and myself put together it has a lot of resources. This is one of those to dig into. I'll pass it back to you, Araceli. <laughs> I think you're mute, Adesadi. There you go. <laughs> Talking. All right. Hey, hey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, you know, one of the things I wanted to make sure to mention is that, you know, we do have, uh, you know, this initiative called uh, Deeper Learning, right? New pedagogies. And some schools have gone a little bit more training than others. I know uh, sometimes I hear from my uh, the upper grade levels that maybe not so much. Uh, but one of the things I want you to remember is, you know, we have some of these, uh, the, the traits that we want our students to have. So I'm going to just kind of take a look and read these out. So this is all the six C's. And those of you who've been around for a while, we know Common Core had the four C's and we went to five C's. We keep adding C's. I don't know how many C's we're going to keep adding. But I want you to think as we talk about lessons, these lessons that we're going to give you, how many of these traits are we hitting? How many of these elements are our students working on as we have them go through these units? So character building, are they good people? As an ELA teacher, you know, it's great. I get excited that they know how to cite a source or know where to put a comma, but I'm more concerned do they care about one another, right? Are they going to be good people? And I do believe that as teachers of, of all subjects, especially literature, that we have an opportunity to open their hearts to understanding other people and to also understand themselves too. So character education, citizenship, how can they contribute to this world, to their communities, to their schools, to the global world, right? We're gonna talk about that. Communication, I don't know about you, but I keep hearing it out there. You let me know, you can give me a thumbs up. Have our students taken a, a back seat to communicating with one another? Are they still on mute? Are they still kind of headphones on, hoodie on, mask on maybe, and still struggling to participate in class discussions? Maybe not, right? Maybe in your classroom, they're vibrant and they're discussing. However, I constantly hear teachers saying, I don't know how to engage the students. The students are still very reluctant to, to discuss and share, right? So how can we get them to communicate a lot better? Uh, what else do we have? Uh, we have our critical thinking skills, right? Really problem solving, thinking of things not waiting on the teacher to give the answer. That's another area I keep hearing where students are kind of waiting out, right? Are not willing to take that risk. Maybe they feel they're gonna be wrong or judged. Collaboration, working with others towards a common goal, right? Uh, accepting other people's viewpoints. Creativity, 
highest form of, of intelligence, something coming up with things that are original. So again, how are we hitting these through some of the lessons that I'm about to talk about? So let me share with you. And I'll see you first. Let me check the chat again. Oh, yep. I think so. He also has, yes. I think so. He also has a six C's, right? Uh, Ron, I don't know if you wanted to chime in. Are there any of these that you think kind of stand out? No, I was just, I was just, uh, you know, giggling. There's six C's in, in MPDL. There's six C's <laughs> in ethnic studies as well. And, and they're pretty interrelated as well. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, let me show you uh, a sample. So a couple of years ago, in fact, uh, right when we came back from uh, distance learning, this is in 2021, I applied and got accepted to present at the National Councils of Teachers of English. Um, because we were still going through dealing with the pandemic, it was virtual, but I got to work with some awesome people throughout the country. And we presented this, this topic here on, right, just different ways to foster discussion about social justice. And my piece that I presented was on how current novels that we're using or works that we're using, how we can bring in that critical lens, that social justice lens. And so how can a story really foster pro-social action, how we can uh, help others, right? So what I basically wanted to do is I didn't want them to just read the book, put it away and take a test. I wanted to really get them to think about how the topics were important in today's society. So take a look at what I did here. So we took on the play, The Crucible. The Crucible is kind of a staple for uh, our juniors, our 11th graders. So, you know, they learn about McCarthyism, they learn about the Salem witch trials, they learn about Puritanism. But for many years, a lot of my students were like this. Now, what does that have to do with us, teacher, right? So what I did instead is I had the students make a list of all the possible social justice issues they were seeing as we were reading the play. And then they narrowed it down to the three that they wanted to discuss. So here's an example of social justice kind of classroom, student-led classroom, right? Where I'm allowing them, giving them some choice and some voice. So they came up with the issue of juvenile justice. It was children who were accusing adults and, and so forth. Did they know what they were doing, right? These 12-year-olds who were accusing uh, these adults of being witches misogyny and sexism, right away they saw some serious issues with this. And then of course, incarceration of people of color and the death penalty. So the students themselves wanted to take this on. Well, what we did first is in order to engage them, I went ahead and gave them a choice of different ways they can, they can demonstrate understanding of the play. Take a look at that list. So I know that some of my students were very verbal, so they were gonna to gravitate to making a film or a short scene or play. Some of my students were a little bit, you know, not so comfortable with working with others and they like to be more creative on their own. So some of them did other things. I even had a group of students who did a puppet show and others who created a research project. So giving students choices, a choice board and acknowledging that they learn differently, right, is another way to to make sure you have that social justice element in your class. So here's a image of my students who reenacted some scenes. They had a lot of fun. And really what I'm doing is I'm lowering that effective filter. I'm showing them that this is a classroom where we all respect each other. We have fun, learning is fun, right? It's still rigorous, still have high expectations, but we're gonna dig deeper. So it really was like a, a slow moving up towards this final project. It wasn't, we're just gonna read it. I'm just gonna put the, the audio, right? And then we're gonna take a test. We wanna move into, again, that NPDL, deeper learning, right, kind of method. Uh, I'm gonna keep going here. After that, we had a Socratic seminar. So now they're bringing in the play plus current research, right? News, uh, maybe their own examples, and we're gonna have a Socratic seminar. Now, this is, of course, um, you know, difficult for some students who are a bit shy, especially if they're going to be speaking out loud in, in a large group. So before we did that, I used a program called Jamboard, where they can do a digital kind of agree, disagree. So these are all different note cards that they can move around so they can process the information before they were asked to speak out loud. Like I said, a lot of teachers saying students are hesitant to speak while maybe giving them a little bit over that time so that they're prepared, especially for our English learners, students with special needs. So here's my class. Of course, it's very hard for the teacher to not talk. That was my rule. My rule was I'm gonna throw the ball there, they're gonna discuss, and I'm gonna step back and they're gonna take the lead. And that's what you'll see in, I believe, one of the videos here. 
you don't have to, we're not gonna watch it right now. But here are my students talking about this article that we read about a young, very young child who did take a gun to school and he, you know, uh, there was some violence there. And do, does a child know what they're doing at that age? And so these kids had a very passionate discussion about does, should we try young people as adults? So you can listen to that. You also get the Google slides. The second part of this was smaller groups, almost like little table talks, and students were able to do some metacognition and talk about how it felt to be in the Socratic seminar. And in fact, I want to call out to attention to this. I know for sure two, if not all high schools, started to create groups, action groups on sexual consent because of the sexual harassment that was happening, some of the bullying, um, and we had other incidents. So, you know, from this discussion, a, a group, especially the group down here, they decided to create a, a club to talk about sexual harassment, the dress code issue at schools and so forth. So uh, again, it was a catalyst for social change. Finally, we ended up with a writing project. And for the writing project, the students had to do a website. I threw them onto Pear Deck first to practice what they were going to write. And then they created, as you can see here, their blogs. So moving them away from just the traditional five paragraph essay to more of a public document. These were actual websites the students created. And I'm just going to take you and let's see if it goes there. Um, they were so proud of their work. They shared the links with other students, even with their own parents, because what it looks like, it's a very professional looking uh, blog or web page, if you will. And again, I've uh, given some uh, website, I'm sorry, some workshops on how to create this here. So again, they're still writing, they're still including, you know, citations, they're still doing textual evidence, so forth, but now they have more creativity and that's part of that social justice um, idea, okay? All right, and that's the lesson I have here on how I use the crucible to bring in a social justice type of lens. So I'm gonna pause right there and let's go ahead and have you take a moment, if you haven't done so, to put again in the chat, and I'll check the chat in a moment. Is there something that you would you know, be interested in doing? Is how, Which work are you currently working on, right? Are there any social justice topics that you can bring up? And what I like to do at the moment is I'm going to call on some of you, so don't be afraid. I'm going to call on some of you to unmute in a moment. Um, any unit you have already done, or are planning to do that has this kind of social justice, ethnic studies, diverse literature lens. So let me have you think about that for a second, right? And be ready for me to call on some of you. Have you done any lessons so far or planning to that take on this type of lens? All right, so I'm gonna call on some of you here. So who do I see? Let's see if they're there. Um, uh, Miss Avila, are you there? I know you did something this past year. I'm gonna call on you. Uh, yeah, we just, I was writing in the chat, sixth grade just worked on um, finishing up the Japanese internment camp, um, read aloud in the study sync, but we also expanded it on finding articles about it. Um, we researched some art projects from some artists that took the tags from the Japanese internment camp um internees and we turned those tags instead of documenting people like animals so to speak with these tags we turned them around as tags of hope so we kind of researched that um we did set up an extra credit project for the kids to go to the Japanese uh, museum in downtown I noticed your ethnic studies group high school kids got to go yes. and I wish we had the funds to do that for the whole sixth grade to go. Um, but we kind of got to go onto the website and just look at some of the exhibits they have. And we just opened it up for parents to take their kids to explore it on their own. Um, we gave like this little um, museum checkoff list, what to see, what topics to discuss with their kids, especially with the photographs there. Um, awesome. we a photo photojournalism project where where they had to um, research the four photographers that were allowed into the different internment camps. 
select photographs from there and just kind of expand on what do they see in these photographs? What does it make them think of? Do they see this in their environments today? Yeah. Um, it just was so insightful. But when I saw you go into the other resource things, um, yes. I saw that there was a book, the I'm not an enemy, the graphic. Yes. Novel. Yes. So having, I'm going to ask you to come to our school to do that. Um, that uh, website with the books. Oh yeah. There's so many graphic novels out there for the kids. And I didn't even know that Yes, uh, yes. for that particular topic, but it gets the boys interested and in reading. And I don't want to genderize reading, but the boys are the, the the group that we really need to get into you know reading different genres and I know that the graphic novels are a big yeah. hit right now but we just did that and it was so enlightening the kids just could not believe that that existed some what 60 years ago 50 years I, ago I, um well and in fact I think you know since Ron is here mm -hmm. uh do open up, I think you mentioned uh, the South Castro Academy, and maybe this is something that hopefully we could get more, more money or more grants for, mm -hmm. for more field trips uh, for places like this. Um, but definitely, I think um, if you, I, one of the areas I would love to see more teachers use, we right now have the free access to book creator. Mm -hmm. So if you're studying Things like graphic novels or any kind of books, right? Especially graphic novels, comic books, there is a way for students to create their own. So imagine how lovely it would be for them to mm -hmm. read a graphic novel such as this and then for them to write something uh, similar and have a book that's actually a digital book. So we'll talk more about that, but I'm going to go ahead and let Ron present on other lessons that we can do. So go ahead, uh, Ron, you can share your screen. And we'll have some more time at the end to share out. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Savila, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Savila, I just want to say that I, I really am excited to hear about those lessons that you're engaging in. Um, I have a resource I can share with you too. It's like a poster lesson that has like seven or eight posters that came from the Japanese American History Museum. I have a couple of extra of those. Oh my God, if, I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you follow up with me, I'll I'll make sure to to bring it by or get it in your hands. And I mean, you know, there's not unlimited funding, but in terms of the field trip that you're talking about, some of the ethics of these grants may be able to pay for that. So if you email me and and connect with me, maybe that's something that we can uh, figure out and organize together. Yeah, uh, definitely. We all, we were privileged we're to be able to have a, a speaker come in. Um, our principal, her mother was interned in one of the um, internment camps. Um, so she was able to come and spend two periods with my kids and just um, have that whole interview process of somebody who actually lived it. Um, and it was just a really great experience for the kids. But I would love those posters. That would be amazing. That's incredible. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I'd love to find out more about that. Um, yeah, we're the right now, one of our high school teachers is working to try to bring, a, we're trying to bring a group of students to Manzanar actually on a turnaround trip. Uh, so that's something that we're all looking forward to, to try to bring that experience to some of our high school students. But um, yeah, more, I'd, I'd love to talk and dialogue more on on that as well. Um, yeah, and so I get excited when people start sharing. I'm like, oh, that's so cool. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing this. I'd love with this. Thank you. So, yeah, so uh, I said, remember, give me a time limit. <laughs> so I don't, go, I don't go overboard. We're at 450. We need to end around 5, 5, 10, so I could give them their time sheet and so forth. So. <laughs> To about 10, 10 minutes maybe yeah yeah okay and um i'm gonna also ask uh please if anybody has any questions please let me know uh i'll be happy to stop and and uh discuss more on any of these project ideas so these are like project ideas these are lesson ideas these are activities uh just to kind of share uh what uh what's what's happening I'm not sure if anybody was here at this particular event, but um, I think it was in October, November. Uh, we had Afro-Panamanian, Afro-Latina author Yaritza Vialba, who's an incredible educator, children's book author. Was anybody at that event? 
we try to put a call out to people across the district. It, it's kind of geared towards K-5, but we invited middle school and some high school classrooms as well. So this was organized by Ricardo Jacinos and Teresa McFayo Castro, two of our tech tosas who are, do incredible work. Uh, so we had about 2,500 students, right, who joined this, this uh, book reading. And we're trying to create these book read alouds like every other month. So that's something we're trying to do uh, this year in this semester two and also into next school year. Is it okay if I share the little video from it, um, Araceli? Just give me a signal if the sound works or not. That okay? I started cooking at the age of 11. That's a part of our Latino culture. You're in the kitchen, you're listening to salsa merengue, like you name it, I was doing it. But my grandmother got sick. And the first thing that I thought about was, hold up, my daughter is not going to be able to experience all of the beautiful things that I've gotten to experience. And so I sat down with each family member and I started to ask them questions, right? I started to ask those questions that maybe they forgot some of the information about because no one really asks us where we come from. They usually just say, okay, so your family's from, and they pick a country. We usually say no. And then me, I usually say, no, you know, soy Dominicana, soy Panameña. And then it usually stops there. They never ask, never ask, well, how did your family get to Panama, right? So no one wants to push a little further. And that was something that I wanted to do because I had questions about when I was growing up, I was tied between, am I Latina? Am I black? Am I like, what am I? Because I'm too dark for some of the Latinas, right? And then I speak Spanish, so some of the black people were like, no, you don't belong here either. So growing up, I had this whole identity crisis. And it wasn't until I became a young adult when I was just like, okay, enough is enough. Yo soy Afro-Latina, I'm Panamanian, this is my history. But last year when I created the book and I started to ask questions and to dig deep about my family, I then began to embrace who I was even more. And now I'm, I'm 35, so imagine at the age of 34 is when I'm saying, okay, now I know this little part about my family's history that we don't really get to talk about, right? So I would say, if you're finding yourself in this like bubble where you're just like, do I belong here or do I belong there? Or how do I fit in? Always keep in mind, we're not created to fit in, um, but it's really good for you to know where you come from because that's where everything begins. So if you say words differently, um, or if you like certain foods or certain kinds of music, that's because of your culture. That's the uniqueness and the beautifulness of your culture. So cool, a cool little video that kind of documents that story and that journey. Another activity that we've been organizing is bringing these virtual reality experiences to students. And so I don't have time to play all of these videos, but when you check out the slides deck, you can you can review them and take a look at them. This one was an experience where students put on the VR glasses and then they're at the March on Washington, uh, 1963, where Dr. King delivered the I Have a Dream speech. It's really incredible. So we've been uh, taking this on a road show. Again, Ricardo and uh, Teresa have been wonderful in um, bringing this educational experience this in the school district. Uh, another read aloud that we did recently is with Dr. Carmen Tafoya. Uh, where she read her book about Emma Tanayuka, who's a lesser known labor civil rights leader from San Antonio, Texas, where I'm from. Uh, Emma Tanayuka was also my Dia's uh, teacher, my aunt's teacher. And so her story is like embedded in my family's story. And I was really excited. We had Dr. Carmen Tafoya read that book to over 3,000 students. So if you're a K-5 teacher, look out for these opportunities and with each of them we also create lessons and activities around those read alouds so when you get the slides deck in the notes section there's going to be links to recordings of these read alouds that you can use with your students in your class as well as activities and lessons that go with them so I encourage you to take a look at those and use those I don't have time to play this excerpt from that reading but if you click on that link this three minute clip is a really great one just to kind of take a look at. The whole thing is about an hour long. The reading of the book is about 20 minutes long. So you can use it inside your classroom. Um, just sharing a few different like projects. Pro I, I think like project-based learning, art-based learning is really important. As long as it's tied with reading, writing, research, speaking, listening skills. So this is a 
a stenciling project that is used to teach about social justice leaders, right? Social justice, the topic of today's conversation. This was at Nelson Elementary uh, just a, a, a few weeks ago. This is a workshop I can bring also to other elementary and middle schools. We actually have the stencils created so students can do this using, um, like younger grade students can use this using sponge paint, sponge brushes, and just regular paint. And um, if you click on this link there, again, there's resources for a paragraph organizer uh, to different quotes that you can add to the stencils. You would actually need the stencils, which I have, and, and I can bring to your school site, um, but that's another uh, project. It requires a little more supplies and like hands-on kind of learning that I can, I can show you. This one is a little easier to replicate or reproduce. Again, elementary. We have elementary teachers here, right, Adeseli? Right, audience? Okay. Um, so this is an elementary lesson where you're helping students to learn about different social justice leaders. It could be connected to Black History Month, Native American Heritage Month, Filipino American History Month, Women's History Month, which we're currently in. Students uh, find a black and white image of that person. Uh, create a collage using Japanese origami paper, have the quote layered on top of it. They do research. They use the quote to write a paragraph about it. These are some examples that I wanted to share with you. All those resources, again, are in the notes section. This is a project I've been doing for about 10 years called the Chikadex, Chikana Chikana. Uh, we also call it the Ethnic Studies pop-up book. So it's basically creating like diorama uh, pop-up books that students create in class. And then they use that as an image for them to present on different topics that they learn about in class. So um, this is an example right here where students create this pop-up book on the Standing Rock Native American protest movement against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And again, if you go to the link in this, in this slide, there's lesson activities, there's readings, there's how to organize the pop-up books, how to create them. If anybody is interested in that, I can help you to create that inside your classroom. It's a great way to get students like learning about all these different topics and all these different like movements and kind of make it come alive inside your classroom. And yeah, it can be used in an ethics studies class, but we've also done this in eighth grade classes and seventh grade classes and ELA courses as well. You can do it. The whole concept is like, they're trying, there's book bannings, right? They're taking places in places like Florida, but the knowledge and the history is popping back up here in Southern California, San Diego Valley, LA, right? So you can easily do it on literature, right? On banned books that are literature as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that I can share, right? This is another project where students create these codices. Uh, when we're studying about the Maya, the Mexica, and indigenous cultural survival, again, there's links to how to uh, organize these activities. Um, this is another activity that I think is rep replicatable, or I don't know if that's a word, um, that you can easily replicate in, in multiple classrooms. It's based on ELA standards. It's based on teaching students how to do evidence-based writing, but through music. So Araceli mentioned that lesson about uh, resistance music earlier. Yes. This, mm -hmm. is, this is kind of like an example of the nuts and bolts of how to actually make that happen. So in this in this slide link, there's a link to this unit plan. And this unit plan has all the lessons, all the activities that you would need to create this. And if you're interested, you could also reach out to me and I can break it down for you or people on your grade level team. Uh, this is a, a great activity that students are able to learn about social justice topics, but through music. Now, it depends if you're high school, maybe there's some songs that would be available if it's middle school, we might need to change or shift the songs a little bit, um, but there's always a way to, to do that work. That same project that I shared for elementary students can also be done with high school students, just a kind of different organizer, different research method, method that I added in, in, uh, in the notes on that document. And then finally, a few years ago, I participated in something called the Lost LA Curriculum Project. This is based on a TV show from KCET called Lost LA. It's based on the archives that exist at USC about local LA history. And um, yeah, there's like about 15 lessons. K-5, 6, 8, 9, 12. These are history social science based, but all of them are based on primary documents. So they hit the same reading writing standards that are in ELA as well. So 
Um, this is a great resource. If you click on that, uh, if you click on that website, there's like over a dozen different um, articles, a dozen different lesson plans, sorry, fully developed lesson plans written by some of the best teachers in SoCal. I was one of the facilitators of that project. So I know that's a lot, but when you have the time, you know, feel free to uh, browse through some of those resources. And if there's any Thing that sparks your interest that you'd like to collaborate on, please reach out to me. I would love to collaborate with more teachers. Thanks for letting me share some of those out of setting. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I can see there, there's some interest there. And I'd like to give an opportunity for anyone else. You know, even if you just are not too sure what you might want to do uh, as far as, you know, some of these uh, projects and so forth, but you know, keep them in mind. Um, also, I'm going to throw out the names, you know, Ricardo and Teresa do an amazing job with our technology. Uh, some of our other TOSAs, you know, uh, invite us in, right? Invite us in to do a workshop. I, I've seen Ron in action where he shares a little bit of his story and then walks the students through a, a little a lesson about sharing their story, telling their story. Uh, there's his email on the chat, right? You can reach out. Um, you know, and I love the fact that these are some hands-on projects. I, I love the technology. I think, you know, it's awesome. But if you really think about it for a, a moment, and I, I know this because I have teenagers in my home here, is sometimes they go all day on that laptop, right? They're carrying that laptop. They have that cell phone. They're constantly connected online. They come home. They're still on their cell phone playing. Maybe they're on video games. So the ability to work tactile, right, to to be proud of something they physically made, and then to talk, talk, talk about it. Talk about, again, having that that uh, voice in the classroom to share what they have. So um, I don't know if there's anybody else here who would like to add their name uh, to, uh, you know, request to have Ron come in or to get some more of these resources. Like I said, you will be getting uh, this uh, slide deck with so many of these uh, resources and links and, and so forth. Uh, all right. Let me go ahead and Can I share one one last thing, Ada Sure. I know I've already probably shared too much, but <laughs> I wanted okay. to sh show that 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 um remember I showed you the, the that codex project? Yes. So the that codex project does take a long time, but um it can also be shortened uh using um stamps that I have. So um I, I create these small codices, right, mm -hmm. which can be created in one 60-minute session where we help this. And, and this can be probably, I'd say, grades three and above, maybe lower, but I'll talk if it's lower than that. But basically, mm -hmm. we create these, um, we glue these together and create these codices, and then we use these stamps, right, to create these, um, to create mm -hmm. these Maya hieroglyphics. And so this is something that can easily be brought to elementary classrooms and have students learn about Maya hieroglyphics and then to write about it, right? Because I'm an advocate for reading and writing. Very I just wanted to share this is uh, accommodated yeah. for lower ones. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we're almost at the end here. So I just kind of wanted to show you again, um, you know, lots of resources here. We'll take a moment to debrief. But uh, as always, I like to share uh, just different things that teachers can use and take into their classroom. So I also created a little um, choice board for teachers. And these are just things that I use throughout um, in my classes. And I'm just going to uh, show you, you know, and, and I know Ron has had us do um, not just the personality wheel, but also uh, what was the other activity that was very kind of, uh, was it the privilege wheel? Um, just to kind of know, you know, especially for those older, you know, students do, they might think like, oh, no, you know, I, I'm a teenager, or I, I don't have any privileges. But then they start looking at other aspects of their life and, and understanding where do they stand as far as privilege in our in our society, right? Um, a couple of short stories you might be familiar with or not. I like to use them as launching, right, into discussions about differences, about uh, accepting others. Um, about cultural, right? Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, customs that we have. I, I use these both when I would sub sometimes for kindergarten classes, first grade classes, all the way to high school classes when I was teaching. So uh, if you're not familiar with them, I'm just going to show you here. Here's, for example, um, an article. And in fact, this one has a link with lots of teacher resources uh, where you can kind of start creating those discussions of what makes us different, but what also makes us similar. And then uh, this short film, I love any grade level, 
again, talking about the acknowledging people and their creativity. Uh, Bao, if you're not familiar with this one, I love this little short story, right? This short film, right? Um, and this one, the present, uh, talking about differently abled uh, individuals, whether it's physically right, differently abled or uh, maybe mental health. How do we treat people who are maybe, you know, uh, are not able to walk, not able to, to use all of their physical capabilities, right? So this is a great little discussion there. There's again, that website on teaching books. And then here's an article that again, has lots of resources uh, for you as teachers. So just kind of wanted to share that. Okay, well, we're kind of coming to the end here. I'm going to be posting um, the timesheet, but if you happen to be on our Pear Deck, so I'm gonna go back to Pear Deck, and I'm gonna, we're not gonna have time too much to go into our breakout rooms, but I'd like to have, the, have you think about the following questions. How would you implement some social justice elements in your classroom or how have you? You don't have to answer all of these, but just think about these. Which resources, maybe some of the uh, lesson ideas that Ron talked about, might you be interested in using? Do you have any questions, concerns, or interests about culturally responsive teaching, ethnic studies, the graduation requirements, so forth? And then, and also, how do these lessons align to NPDL? Some of you are doing uh, uh, many of these kind of projects, right, that push our students to do more than just the worksheet or just the multiple choice test. So I'd like you to think about that. I'm going to move to this slide here. And if you're on uh, Paradigm, you can answer those questions there. There's, again, that code. You can also put it on the chat. And as I upload the timesheet, I want you to think about that. Be ready to maybe share out and have it final comments. All right. So again, give me a moment while I upload that timesheet. And if you have any questions, this would be a good time to ask that question. And this. All right. I will also be emailing the timesheet just in case you can't get it right now, um, along with the um, Google slide deck and so forth. All right, we have there again, let me double check here. See if, all right. All right, so how would you implement this? We'll have some people typing in those answers there. And let me call on another familiar face. Uh, Raul, I know I, I remember you from last, here you were over at Fairgrove, right? So now you're over at the high school at Los Altos. Uh, so uh, Raul, if you're there, let me see here. I know we miss yeah. him at Fairgrove. I, Cabral, I, we miss you. <laughs> oh, I miss you guys too. <laughs> uh, I think just providing options for kids always works. But I think one thing that was, was uh, so, so, somebody said, is connecting it to reading or connecting it back to the literature. And I think that's the most important thing. So that's what I try to do. It's, you know, make sure it's, it's a reading is connected to something and then providing students with the option. So I love like the art projects. Like if you give students an option for that, then it's a little bit more inclusive for everybody. But uh, I think sometimes it's just, what, what I struggle with is um, finding good articles. Like sometimes it's, it's about a certain topic or, or a certain event or person, but I just never feel like it's perfect. So I think, uh, um, I don't know, just just being lucky enough to run into something that's really good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, this I think coming to these kind of workshops, going to preferably would be better to go to in person where you can actually collaborate with other educators. I love the collaboration that just happened right now between, uh, was it Ms. Avila and is, is it uh, with Ms. Kemp? right? Like, hey, I like that lesson. Hey, we need more of that, right? I, I think we need a lot more of that, especially as we take on these topics. And I, I thank you, Ms. Avila, for that comment, right? Yes, um, this is not going to be easy road, right? Um, there are going to be some challenges. So I think right now, if you're watching the news, seeing other districts, you have parents who are saying, we don't want the kids learning about this. Uh, and sometimes the way I approach this is, you know, what does 21st century skills mean? What does global economy mean? Who do you think are, your children are going to be interacting with, right? They're going to be interacting with a diverse population and they need to be able to understand 
uh, other people understand themselves. Uh, Ron, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I just think you said it so wonderful. I mean, I, I, I just want folks to know, like, I'm so inspired about being here in this district. I think there's a lot of innovative practices happening and so many uh, teachers that have been here and put their roots in this district and that build such positive school cultures and classroom cultures. And so I'm just really excited to be here with y'all and I would love to collaborate with anybody that wants to share. Mm -hmm. All right. Can, uh, is it okay if I respond to Ms. Avila's comment yes. in the chat box too? Yes, um, yes, definitely. And before we go, if those of you who are willing, if you're willing to turn on that camera, we'll take a little quick picture and uh, just to kind of have it, uh, you know, a little moment to say cheese because we want to definitely promote more workshops like this um, we need to have continue having this discussion. So let's take a quick little picture here. Yay. All right. And I want to thank uh, Ron uh, for being here. Yay. Thank you for all your information. All right. All right. Let's see if anyone else. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Uh, Oh, give me one second. Let's do another one. Ready? <laughs> one, two. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. All right. And uh, like I said, uh, time sheet is there. Are there any questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you all for being here. Lots of information. Like I said, we'll get that to you and stay warm and safe out there. Please let me know if you do any of these projects. I would love to highlight you in our newsletter that I sent out. Oh. <laughs> uh, if you have uh, any student-led projects, things like this, this would be great. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. All right. Ron, did you say you wanted to address the comment? Yeah, I didn't get a chance to. I just wanted to say that um, I'm here to help with that question, you know, mm -hmm. with, with any of those concerns that come up. I've been doing this work for a long time and with elementary schools. And mm -hmm. so the district that I came from, it would come up sometimes because we have a, a pretty strong religious institution close by the school um, that housed a lot of families. And so, um, you know, it, it's it's not it, there's no easy response to it, but I try to go back to the the California legislation, right? And so uh, the California Fair Act is mandates the teaching of LGBTQ history from kinder to twelfth grade, right? Mm -hmm. Every single school year, and so helping parents to see that there's a difference between sexual education and making LGBTQ people visible in the curriculum. Um, and then helping to remind them that we're not making a decision as a school site to do something that's not being asked of us to do, right? But it's the state legislature. Right. And so we would listen to parents' concerns and thank them for coming. But we would also say, these are the pieces of legislation. This is the law. These are the people you can contact if you have an issue with that. But our school is following the legislative mandates that we're being tasked with. And this is one of them to create safe and inclusive and <laughs> anti-bullying, you know, spaces for our students. So I don't mean to say that there's an easy response. I just feel like it's important to be, to have those right. talking points, you know, I just want okay. to share that. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I'll definitely be emailing you about the poster project and I want you to come and, um, meet with our middle school team as far as the language arts team goes to do those pop-up books because I feel like we just need something else to tie the curriculum into instead of the regular projects we've been working on. So please, I would I would love to. I'm really excited to hear about what you've been teaching about Japanese American internment camps mm -hmm. as well. Um, I'm well, really involved in, in the... Go ahead, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's such an important topic for me because my grandmother was also interned um, in Tulu Lake. And then just talking with, uh, well, I'm part Japanese. I'm sure you could see from the name Yukiko, but um, she has dementia. So she couldn't come in and talk with us. But talking with my principal and her sharing her mom's story with us, her mom was able to come in and just talk with my kids. And it was such an eye opening experience. And like I said to Ara Sally with the photojournalism project, um, 
like Dorothea Lang. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was a photographer that was allowed in there. And she, you know, said through one of her interviews that she wasn't able to document or show the truth until after the internment camps had ended. And she only could photograph them happy because it didn't they didn't want to make America look bad. And so we had a lot of discussions about that. And then one of the photos about Manzanar with the big flagpole with the American flag flying in the middle, we had so many discussions about that photo. And one of my students who never talks, never, he's like a D student, barely passing. He came up with such a strong statement about it. And he said, wow, that's such a sad statement because the American government is constantly reminding these these people in the camps who's in power who's in control and when you look up every day you can't forget that for those three years that they were interned and when he said that I turned and looked at him and I said oh my god this is such a powerful statement because and we had a whole discussion about the American flag and what it symbolizes freedom peace you know all these things but it was the complete opposite it was being used as a symbol of power against another group of people and just you know going beyond again what's in steady sync like steady sync is your your starting thing if anything (laughs) just go off on other things but yeah yeah that's my constant message right the constant message like look at what your students need right what what are the voices that need to be heard there um so you know and i would love to see what projects they come up with uh, yeah. with this. uh did they read a uh, farewell to manzanar is is that part of the no, unit or- that one i think is a high school level book it's not it's but it could school. be part of literature that could be brought to them like that website you were sharing yeah yeah, yeah definitely that poster project would be amazing um ron because you know speaking of posters the um the executive act 9066 was on that poster of all yeah. japanese yeah. people of ancestry like taking these negative these negative media things and turning it around. I don't know what your posters look like, but it would be something to connect it to that, you know? Yeah, totally, totally. The posters are a part of a a story written by a child who was interned there and it has these different excerpts and it's Uh like an interactive lesson where the students like walk to observe the different posters and have like Uh a writing activity. I was going to share that, um, I, I'm really involved in the Southern California bonsai community because mm-hmm. uh, I'm, a, I'm a bonsai practitioner. And mm-hmm. so I've, I'm in community with a lot of uh, Japanese American folks who mm-hmm. have memories of their families being interned. I don't know. There's not someone in our community that was interned and then became a bonsai mm-hmm. practitioner, but that's the story of bonsai in America. And so I have a, a lesson that I do where I actually bring in my bonsai trees. I teach students mm-hmm. about bonsai's connection with right. Japanese American internment. I'd love to do that in the future. Yeah, if that would be that topic. so good. Sure we still I mean, we did that. we did that last week, but it's always wonderful to revisit it. Yeah. You know, to just remind them of the topic they were talking about and here's something else with it. Yeah, and there's some really great media about that. There's some really great films that bonsai practitioners have made about the connection between bonsai and because it was a form of like cultural survival in the internment Mm -hmm. camps. The first bonsai show in America was in an internment camp. Um, And there's there's trees, there's bonsai trees that are still alive that were planted in the internment camps that are at very um, famous bonsai museums today. Wow. And so there's like a, there's a whole activity that, that I could potentially do with students and that I really enjoy sharing. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we, I'll definitely you know, send you I'm an email. You. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And, and Araceli, thank you for putting this on. You, I, this is like right up my alley. So all of these resources and just ideas to work with the kids. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for always being here. <laughs> Have a good night. Bye. 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 No, you're not recording anymore or stop recording. I am. (laughs) Hold on.